Perfect timing. Hey. There you go. Do you see me? We can. Okay. And we're, I just clicked the live button. So. <laughs> um, no, no. Okay. Of course. Yeah. You okay. Recording. Yeah. <laughs> we're sorry. It, it kind of goes automatically if I don't stop it. So welcome everyone to another edition of the Perception Action Journal Club. Uh, ooh, Mark's got his guitar. Maybe he'll, <laughs> <laughs> he'll play us a song at the end. Um, this um, is this edition. I want to do kind of a roundtable, focusing on uh, doing an ecological, ecological dynamics approach to youth sports, P, physical literacy. I think we can all lump it all in those in that bucket. Kind of some of the unique issues. Um, there's a great people here working not only on all levels, theoretical, applied you know, company, you know, developing material, practical materials. So I think it will be a, a good discussion. So I thought I would start by letting some of the faces, I've had a couple of people interviewed. I think this is the first time for on this uh, format. So I'll start with uh, James. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, James? Sure. Thanks for letting me come on, Rob. Um, yes, yeah, first time I've been on one of these uh, kind of journal clubs, open discussion forums. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a senior lecturer at Liverpool John Moores University keen interest in skill acquisition and motor learning and that's what I kind of teach on on our course but it's on a physical education degree within the department of sports science so I do take a very how we can adopt some of these principles an ecological approach mainly but I do teach the uh, in my first year a cognitive approach as well um, to kind of give the students an opportunity to explore all avenues um, and yeah, it's start trying to take some of these principles and apply them in a physical education setting is where a lot of my research has kind of been in the last 45 years or so. Okay, cool. And then Michael. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, Rob. Uh, my name is Michael Zwiefel. I'm the owner of Building Better Athletes, uh, a sports performance uh, facility in the Midwest here and also a team member at Emergence. But for the, about the past decade, I've been coaching. Um, youth athletes from elementary to middle school, high school. So any, anything of that, you know, 18 years or younger age, um, any sport you can think of, but more from a performance side of, of, of side of things rather than like a sport coach. So that's kind of my background. Cool. And your fellow emergence, uh, Tim Rich. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, like Michael said, very, very similar situation to Michael as well. Obviously team, team member here at emergence. I have been for uh, about six or seven months here now. Um, currently at a private facility uh, here in Minnesota, as well as uh, just picked up teaching some some courses at a local university as well. Just trying to get into the, the spreading the word aspect of this, but um, but no, I mean I've, I've been in a, a situation where I've been lucky to be able to to start to apply a lot of the work that, that James and Mark. And I mean the, the guys that are really putting their foot in the in, in the ground and doing the research. You know, now we're trying to figure out okay, how can we go about actually applying this on a daily basis. Um, for the most part, over the over the course of the last five, six, seven years, I've I've been working pri primarily with the you know eight to eighteen, and then I was uh, I spent about three to four years at the college level as well. So I've had a, a pretty uh, wide range of, of athletes that I've worked with over the last couple of years, but but that's where I'm at. Cool. And last but not least, Mark. Uh, greetings from Stockholm. Um, thank you for inviting me on. My name is Mark O'Sullivan. I'm from originally from Ireland. I was born at a very young age. <laughs> uh, took, took the usual path to um, to uh, into sport, uh, into research, into coaching, which was, of course, being a DJ and running record labels. Um, I've, uh, I'm head of youth development in the 8 to 12 age group at AIK, and I work with our research and development department, which I set up with a few colleagues, James, particularly James Vaughan and Dennis Fourteen. Uh, two highly talented individuals. Um, I'm also doing a um, PhD through Keith Davidson, Sheffield Hallam University, around the ecological approach to we're applying at AIK here in Stockholm. Okay, hmm? great. Yeah, you have a very unique <laughs> background uh, and mix of it. I think it's good. Um, the um, so where I thought I would start, maybe um, maybe I'll start with you, Mark. I was just reading uh, your yesterday. I was reading your physical literacy paper. Um, so I thought we'd start, you know, what are some of the challenges, limitations we're trying to address with kind of the more traditional approach to coaching young kids, uh, PE, physical literacy, all those kind of issues. What, are, what do you see as kind of the main things we need to address with moving towards ecological approach? 
Yeah, well, the thing is, the the story behind this paper, which um, James there and uh, Carl Woods and Keith and others got involved in, it started um, in 2018, I think, uh, or 2019, yeah, March. And I was presenting at a, at a conference for the Swedish Sports Confederation. And this physical literacy thing, which of course I've heard and read about before, was everywhere. And, you know, it was a thing, it was measured, it was it was saving lives, it was the saving, you know, stopping kids from being obese and all her. And I, I just decided, I was with Jean Coté at it, and we were speaking about it, so we were kind of like, okay, well, why is everyone speaking about this? And when I went around asking people, I found that nobody had the same understanding of what it was. Some people were just saying we're going to put physical literacy into schools but what is it and nobody could really explain what it was so I did a blog and I kind of did a lot of big literature and research and the essence of what what I tried to capture is that we really are working with what's called fundamental movement skills is what they were applying but I was suggesting that really it's really about function functional movement skills because when I, I've worked with people in professional sport, you know, and I could probably say some of them don't, cannot even do some of those fundamental movement skills. <laughs> and I was wondering why, wait a minute. And then some people saying, yeah, we're testing kids on these skills, more fundamental movement skills. And I was like, why are you doing that? You know, where's the value and meaning in that? And the, the, I think that, I think that it required that we really needed to dig into this a bit deeper and that's when I turned to James and Carl and I had already done a blog and I got a good response and, and I said look I think there's a paper here we can really get deeper into an ecological approach from it and, and essentially it's just basically what I'm saying is that if you want to have this idea of physical literacy it's 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 a interaction between individual and environment over a lifetime and it's that fit it's a fit between individual and, and environment over a lifetime as opposed to something that um gets measured and something that you have and you possess and you own and something that you prescribe and you know so that mm -hmm. that's kind of the story about it it, came, it just basically be, started because i was really pissed off at this <laughs> and i think james james i must admit though i've been really inspired by some of james's work particularly one story which i've demanded that he will tell tonight <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, that's no, kind of, yeah an introduction yeah. to it yeah yeah no and i like how you you in the paper you circle it back to the origins where you know the um is it whitehead the yeah. kind of the, the, the kind of the basic idea was there and then kind of got lost uh a lot of mostly practicalities it seems like but yeah James, you know yeah you know, Rob, i was seeing people give give presentations where they were saying that you know we're spending this amount of dollars or pounds on medical bills in 1980 something and now we're spending six times that amount and blah and they're saying it's because of people's health no that's just inflation <laughs> you know <laughs> so there was yeah. yeah there was a lot of this and everything was about health and it was about health and connecting it to health and we have too many you know kids aren't moving enough they're obese they're this they're that and really you know it's for me from i think when i have children myself i've learned so much about movement and interacting with environment having children and it really is about meaning and value mm -hmm. yeah and, and health is just an outcome and the story a very simple thing you could say is like why does a child climb a tree well, probably to climb higher than his friends and see further. Why does a, tr a child climb a tree in September? To climb higher than his friends, see further, and probably steal an apple. <laughs> so, the, you know, there's more meaning about, and the, the the whole idea is that not to be healthier or more coordinated. It's just the meaning and value. The health are just outcomes of all these. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's and kind of where I'm pushing things. I think James might be able to correct me if I'm. <laughs> yeah, J James, tell us how how did you kind of get into this and. It what you wanted yeah. to change about things you were you were seeing yeah i st first started working on physical literacy back in 2015 or came across the term um and that was in australia um and uh, we were we were taking quite a a reductionist approach to it in some ways may you say but we were trying to measure how physically literate a child was 
Um, but we, we were trying to use Margaret's um, more recent definition. So she would de define physical literacy as the physical motivation, confidence, um, to, to competence and knowledge and understanding to lead, lead, lead a physical active life. So we were kind of trying to measure to understand, well, how physically literate are children at the moment? And, and I see a lot of that like across across the globe going on at the moment and and i think it's actually moved slightly away from margaret's what i've read of her original intentions of why she got into physical literacy and i i think we kind of get caught up in the definitions of what what it is but really not the reason why she wanted to kind of explore this more meaningful um experience of being physically active and it and and she kind of when I when I've read back on some of her literature, what she highlights um, and really nicely is around actually back in 1993 when she she put this term forwards, it was in a reaction because she felt children's opportunities to play had been marginalised in society. And there's two reasons for that, or what she gave. One was for professionalisation of youth sport. So when they used to play. We now have an adult potentially in there coaching them instead. And then obviously just social cultural aspects of now kids have transitioned from out, outdoor play back in 1970s was kind of where children, eight out of the top 10 play spaces were outside. Now that's reversed, but we have them inside due to technologies and the society we live in. So she, her idea was to go, well, no, I want to create an opportunity really for, to recapture children to have these more unstructured play opportunities because through that, as Mark's highlighted, this value and meaning and, and, and yeah, in, enjoying kind of p playing and through that, we will see, yeah, a more ecological approach, shall we say, mm -hmm. to, to, towards play um and, and and yeah and supporting children to develop so i guess that's where i think we may have slightly mm. however yeah. as, as it's to be to being um yeah, caught on because everyone think likes the term because it, it quite likes that, that the meaningful mean about physical activities not just about quantity it's about the quality of the experience mm. and, and, and pulling that out um, yeah, so that's a few thoughts on it, I guess. Uh, yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense, James. And I guess, you know, uh, maybe, you know, Michael. So Michael and Rich, you, I know you are both uh, were involved in, in developing and delivering the, is it the Origins program from Emergence, which focuses, it's for, it's, I know a little bit about it. It's for youth sports coaches, right? And have you tried to adopt some of these same kind of, uh, moving, you know, making people more exploring, moving away from, you know, focusing on measurables. Can you talk a little bit about what the program is, Michael, and, and, and kind of how you've tried to address some of these these limitations? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, kind of what uh, Mark and James has kind of touched upon, that's kind of what we delve into. This is for sport coaches, for performance coaches, for PE teachers, for parents, because in reality, here in the United States, those that coach youth sports are typically parents who are probably uneducated and unaware of some of these um, basic principles. And so it was kind of geared towards just giving education towards those that are involved with these athletes. And that term physical, physical literacy, it was they really discussed a lot. And, um, and some of the, you know, the cons of that using that term and, you know, one we get both Mark and James kind of touched upon was the kind of the obsession to measure everything in the physical, in the physical world. And so that word literacy, you know, we kind of stem that back towards schooling, right? That we can measure things like we can measure math or we can measure English or, you know, the, the American uh, language, whatever it may be. So where you go into school, you learn the alphabet before you learn how to spell. And then you learn to put together sentences. Then math, you learn basic numbers, the, the order, the addition, subtraction. Then you can do things more down the line. And that's how coaches are classically trained, that you have to master A before going to B to C, then finally to Z. And so we're trying to break that dogmatic approach that there's not necessarily this, this form of physical literacy doesn't apply the same way as it was in the classroom where there's declarative knowledge that you, there's things in the classroom that are that way because that's how they universally work. Well, in the movement world, in the sporting world, in the physical world, those rules don't apply. And so trying to break down some of those walls was uh, one of the big things that we try to tackle in this, in, in this project. Yeah. No, that's Rich, do you have any 
thing you want to add? Well, yeah, I mean, it, that, that's, I mean, Michael obviously um, touched on a lot of it there. For us, it was really just trying to get uh, parents, coaches, teachers, anybody, anybody involved in the development process, getting them away from this idea that it, that it has to be done the way that the coach wants it. Um, I, I've had an opportunity, uh, you know, currently and in, 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 in some past experiences, um, have worked a lot in club sports. And it's just, it's, it's so, everything is so linear and so robotic. And so this is the way that we're going to do it because you're, you're playing for this club. So this is how we're going to do, you know, I mean, this is how you have to move. This is how you have to behave. This is how you, it's just a constant, constant process of, of children being told what to do and how to do it. And it's, it's really starting to, to hamper their, their creativity and their abundance in there. And, and, and as Michael kind of touched on in, in the introduction portion of Origins is this, this professionalization and this monetization and this, this, this having parents basically prioritize their agenda or coaches prioritize their agenda over the development of the kids is, is really just sucking the fun out of sport. And without sport, there's no reason for these kids to, to move. And so if you, you know, if, if, a, if a child quits a sport at the age of 13, 14, 15, because it wasn't fun anymore, what's the likelihood they're going to continue to move later on in life? Well, I mean, you know, some of the research and the stats are showing that the likelihood is not very well. If you have poor, poor experiences early on, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be something that sticks with you. And so we wanted to, like Michael said, um, basically try to find a way to make sports fun again for kids. How, how can we allow them to, to start to be creative and abundant and explore and just allow these environments for kids to interact with, as opposed to, you know, um, being this dictator and this bearer of all truth. And, and one thing that I love, uh, Mark, and you, you touch on it a little bit, it's this idea, I think, of the, the functional, not fundamental. That is that is so spot on. Um, I mean, because it is, especially in youth sports, it's all about the way you guys put it in the paper. It's basically like fundamental movements are the initiation into sports. So, you know, heaven forbid you play a sport before you can perform these fundamental movements. And all that's doing is just holding these kids back. They're, they're, they're again, we're, 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 uh, we're kind of sheltering their creativity. And honestly, the, the question I always ask to myself is if it's, if it's practical, if it's purposeful, if it's useful, relevant, like how are these solutions actually matched to the problem as opposed to, well, did you do it this certain way? Well, if I solved the problem and, and it was functional and useful and, and relevant, then, then why are we even having the conversation? And so I think for us, Michael and I spend a lot of time talking about how this idea of fundamental movement really doesn't need to be there as long as the functionality of the movement is and what that can do for the creativity and the abundance uh, of movement solutions is I think tremendous. So, yeah. Can I, can I add something there? Yeah, please? go for it. Yeah. Um, there's something really important, a sentence in there that said, without sport, children don't move. And I think that's really interesting. Is it, is it, a, you know, why do we need sport for children to move? Yeah. Well, I guess I no. I mean, you, you, that's it's a great point. I shouldn't say without sport, there's no reason to move. I, I guess no, but no, I, no, no, but it's it's interesting. It's, it is a quite a, a thing. It's like that now. Sport is uh, you learn to play a sport through organized sport. Of course, is what you mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's kind of almost an issue that it's it's the assumption that we must organize sport or prescribe okay. something, otherwise children don't move. And for me, that means there's something inherently wrong with her. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, I see that. Like, we almost have, like, as a grown, when you get older, like, you can't go out and say, let's all meet and play tag <laughs> with your friends, right? It, it would be, and then another one, like, Arizona, we do a lot of hiking. Like, yeah. hiking is just sometimes a fancy name for walking. <laughs> but it just sounds more sporting. It sounds like you're doing something like that is more, you know, serious versus let's just go move together. <laughs> like we don't do that. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I cause like there's, I think one of the a lot of conversations I had with James was about, mm -hmm. and this is really, James gave me a lot of good insights in this is about how government policy is often is, is it's, it's very prescribed. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a strategy. It's a pre it's a prescribed strategy. And what's really interesting is that when James got, I, that's why I got really digging deeper into this. And so over here in in uh, Sweden, there's we have government strategies about with the best intentions about getting children to move, but it seems to be there's so many different silos in governments. So the example I give is that 
we have this strategy, we're going to get kids moving, there's obesity, there's all this, and it's health, and kids... And then you have, in the city centre in Stockholm, they put up, near the city centre, a side road, they put up this um, speed monitor, so cars, if they were going down the side road, they could see the speed they were going, if they were going too fast. And then, you know, obviously, some kid on a skateboard went, I wonder, will that register me if I go by? And it does. Okay. So, of course, what he does, he texts his mates. The next thing, you, the whole area is full of kids on skateboards trying to beat their speed record. Mm. And what happens? The monitor is taken away. And, <laughs> you know, and then one government is saying we need children to move more. One government section is we need children to move more and do this. And the other one is saying, no, there's too many kids on the street doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're blocking cars. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. picking up on um, what Mark's and saying, and I think it, sorry if that's all right, just around um, the uh, one problem we I think we have with physical literacy and also around these idea terms such as fundamental movement skills is that they're asymmetrical in that we're focused on the person and not giving any thought for the wider environment and how that actually shapes and influences. And, and Margaret leans very heavily on feminology and these concepts, which again, highlight the importance of the interaction between the individual and the environment. So we do start to move. And I think that's something we really wanted to emphasize in Mark's paper and the work we've done on this is around actually the importance of the environment and taking an ecological approach and the symmetry between the two. And, and, and that's so even when we may be assessing fundamental movement skills, are we actually capturing the true movement ability or capacities or capabilities of of the child um if we are just focusing on how they're moving but not thinking about the environment which they're moving in or we're prescribing those and and i think that resonates more just in how we sometimes may go around teaching or coaching and this idea of what skill is and how skills are learned is something we fill up or develop instill into children rather than letting them evolve like a an evolve a fit as Mark was saying, an evolving fit between the environment and the individual. And the more they explore and that environment, and the more we create those opportunities, new opportunities will emerge as as they develop. So there's, there's a real important point here around this importance of the ind individual's environment fit between the children, and and that's something which yeah. We, we need to focus on more. And it, so I don't have a problem with measuring. I think it, it holds an, a potential useful opportunity to help teachers plan and progress progress, et cetera. But I, I am leaning, we maybe need to rethink how we're doing it. And, and I think it. your story, James, would add a lot of value here about that. Girl. You really want to hear this story, don't you, Mark? No, I, I think it's excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's all right. I, I've already done it on one of Rob's uh, shows. Yeah, oh, is it like, oh, the Gallup story? That's, the a, Gallup good, story. that's yeah, a good story still. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you to, do you want to demonstrate? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So, again, as I mentioned, back in 2015, when I was doing work around this kind of fu fundamental movement skills, physical literacy, when I first came across the term, we we were measuring children's motor skills in schools and, and um, we, the way we did that is in a very kind of traditional approach in that I would ask a child to demonstrate a fundamental movement skill. So one would be a throw, catch would be another fundamental skill because if you can throw and catch, you can go off and play baseball, you can go off and do all these others. It's fundamental to these sports. That's the idea behind it. There's object control skills, and then there's obviously other fundamental skills like how you how you move in your environment or locomote. So running, jumping, all all of these, and, and one of those skills is this idea of a gallop. Okay, so as in a, it's like a skip, like a horse would do. I, I, I always struggle to explain, but like a horse would do, um, but it's a skip, but one leg never mm -hmm. never overtakes the other leg, so we kind of skipping along. You get the idea, um, and. I, I first of all gave this wonderful demonstration to the child of how to gallop. And I, I, I'm always tempted to get up and show you in the room, but I, I won't get it all in the show. <laughs> so I, I showed this masterful gallop across the hall. And then I said to the child, would you like a practice? And she was quite keen. She had a go. Couldn't for a life uh, just tripping over her feet. Or first of all, couldn't actually move. Just wasn't able to. To, to start and I said oh do you want me to show you another one and she's like no no I've got it and and she tried and and it was it was this kind of step 
well, and she just ended up walking across the hall, and I thought, oh, that's not very nice. like. I said, oh, are you okay? Yeah, okay. Well, don't worry about it. It's all right. Oh, there goes the bell. It's break time, and and she disappeared into into the playground, which had this nice um, grassy area, which was on this little hill. I saw her run up to her friends, and I'm out there just chatting to the classroom teacher and, and a few of the other colleagues I was working with, and I'm watching these children playing tag on this hill, and I'm just watching, thinking, oh, we're really just loving being active and enjoying it and much more much more fun than they were in my testing environment but anyway that's by the by but when she started to her attention was on catching this other child who is racing down the hill she starts following and what skill emerges this wonderful gallop this actual moving this way of locomoting because if you start if you try to run down stairs or you're running down you automatically, your gait will change through that interaction between the task and the environment and your cap but action capabilities. Now, that girl had the action capabilities to gallop, but I wasn't able to get them out because the environment was sterile. There was no, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and that's really important. And I think sometimes, and that's something I've always taken with me forward, moving forwards now around, okay, I'm going to, and I, I know the guys in emergence and what Mark and the, the, it's, it's about what, actually what kind of landscapes can we create to let these movements emerge from them and, and, and are they functional? So the gallop for her was functional in that trying to catch a friend, but yeah. So there yeah. you go, Mark, I've got it here. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I think perfect, I love that the story too. Logical <laughs> approach. Yeah, no, and you're right. The functional the galloping has no function when you're running on the flat ground. Someone's just telling you to do it. Um, I wanted to revisit this functional, the functional, the fundamental movement skills idea, and because I, it, I don't know about you guys, it's one of the most common pushbacks I get from coaches, or they say, "I love, I love this ecological idea of self-organization, and it really appeals to me." after I give my athlete the fundamentals, right? Oh, oh you can't let them play soccer till they can dribble. Uh, you can't let them, you know, do this till they can catch. Rich, kind of what What do you think? Do you talk, talk about, like, building on James' example, like fundamentals will, there are no real fundamentals, but the basic coordination will emerge if you just put it in context? Or how do you well, like respond he, to that? Yeah, well, I mean, like you said, I mean, because I, I used to be that that coach. I used to believe that, that you had to move in a, a certain way before you could, you know, you have to you have to be able to do A, B, and C before you can before you can move on. And mm -hmm. I think he that the story just sums it up perfectly. The, the capabilities are inside these athletes. I, I think we we sell them short a little bit. I don't think we give them enough credit. They're they are inherently creative, and they they really do possess um, the, the the capabilities to to solve a lot of problems that we that we ask them to. It's just the fact that I think we get in the way. And so over the course of the last one to two years, I've just really taken this approach where it's it's not about me giving solutions. It's about me setting up problems. And the the creativity and the abundance and the just the the functionality in which young learners are able to actually solve problems when they're scaled properly to to where they're where they're at at that current point has really been tremendous. I, I'll sit back and you know and I'll watch some of these activities take place. And I'm just like, well, I would have never thought to solve a problem in that way. Um, but but that's <laughs> that's why I'm not telling them to. I mean, it just kind of goes to show like why we need to get out of the way a little bit. And as long as we're setting up tasks. Um, that, that are scaled in the right, you know, in the right spots and are scaled to meet them where they're at. Um, again, this idea of, of functional, not fundamental, just it, it resonates with me because, yes, they are solving these problems. Yes, they're practical. The solutions are practical and they're purposeful and they're more importantly, or I should say most importantly, they're related to uh, or I'm sorry. Yeah, they're related to how the solution matches the problem. So so how how am I to say that what you know, what their solution was wasn't fundamental? Um, if it's functional and that's just like this idea of allowing kids to interact with the environment uh, and, and me taking a step back has has really opened a, a lot of doors for me yeah no i think that's great and michael uh, another kind of common one i get and i'll give an answer like richie is well what if they can't they don't emerge like what if these these coordination i don't you know i think rich kind of hit on a little bit with the scaling and the getting what what's what do you kind of do to address that in, in your thinking and the origins kind of approach yeah, obviously, as Rich said, the first step would be changing the task and changing the environment. If what you're setting up and providing isn't um, allowing an emergent behavior that maybe you're looking for, then you as the coach, as the environmental architect, you have to change something in the task or environment. Also, under, understand and appreciate that, especially with youth athletes, 
the different time scales that they, they can they learn and different things emerge for them is so wide ranging. Just because an uh, you know a kid isn't picking up something you know in the first session or two sessions doesn't mean that maybe they aren't having this this rich interaction with that task or environment. And it just it's a different time scale for them. It takes a little bit longer of a process for them. And again, as Mark said earlier, this is more process oriented than just you know outcome oriented. That you have to master these movements, and until you do so, we can't move on. So, uh, you know, would, you know, I think it goes back to just allowing and understanding that these are kids and, and appreciating that they're not there. There's no magical progression order that, you know, week one, we work on this, every kid masters it. And then week two, we can go to this next thing that you as the coach have to allow some freedom, have to allow some uh, room for them to make mistakes, allow for them to be creative and adaptive because they'll all learn at different time scales. And then also that you have to then manipulate the task and constraints to try to fit each individual athlete within your session. If that's in a one-on-one -on -one setting, that's another case. Or if it's a group setting, there's various ways to manipulate the, the, the space, to manipulate different time, to, to manipulate uh, equipment to allow each unique athlete in that setting to have their emergent behavior kind of be owned and, and, and have some autonomy over that process. So that's how I, I, I look at that. Uh, if a kid isn't, if their movement isn't emerging as I would see fit, you know, first and foremost, again, their kid, let that time, give them time, give them repetition, give them experience and exposure to as many environments as possible. And this is the thing with this paper we talked about, uh, talks about is that youth athletes should be about their an interaction with a wide variety of information rich environments. As many varied envir environments as possible will lead to them having a much more wider bandwidth of emergent behaviors and movements rather than, you know, strictly following some linear progression. Yeah. No, I think that's important. I wanted to raise uh, this is something I raised and like, I, I've kind of changed my thinking a little bit about this. I, I don't think following this approach we're all talking about, then explored the, the fundamental, the functional movements emerge doesn't mean, doesn't preclude you from stepping in and saying, Hey, try this try bending your knees more, um, you know, but you're doing it for a very different reason. You're not correcting to try to get this one movement pattern. Just like here, here's a little guide. <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't do it that exact way. Do, do you guys kind of think along the same way? I see you, Rich, not, Mark. Yeah. yeah. The, the thing is that I think that the important word here and probably a big misconception around it is the idea of self-organization. I think many people assume it's positive. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it, it yeah. Self and it's not, no, because a good coach, self-organization can also have a maladaptive movement or something, you know, mm -hmm. so a good coach understanding what self-organization is, will able to identify what the rate limiters are. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? They will identify, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. what constraints do I need to manipulate here? So there's a big, I've, I've noticed in a lot of conversations going around, there's a big misconception that self-organization is only positive mm -hmm. yeah no, you I, I agree yeah no totally yeah. it's a, but if you understand uh, self-organization it will help you when you see these individual self-organizing if you want to say under constraints but it's not happening it's you know it's not coming together or whatever that that will help you mm -hmm. adapt maybe manipulate the environment task or whatever to yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I, th I think Michael and from Michael and Rich, you guys were describing it's there is a certain you have to let it develop and give it time, but it also it's not just hands off and like you're talking no. about changing all the constraints, scaling things like it's very involved. Coach is still very actively, it's very much involved. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So, can I just pick uh, up on something here, Rob? Like, sure, just yeah. I we often like say if we take a cognitive approach to this, and I'm not going there, but you'd say like um, knowledge of and knowledge of knowledge of uh, oh, um, knowledge of performance, and so potentially of like say move your arm when you're throwing, move your arm two centimeters to the left, okay, or, or to, mm. to, to try to help. But to me, that's again, it's it's an internal tension of focus potentially. But what would be a good way to do it from an, an ecological play, place maybe which would transfer to the environment so say if you're doing this outside would be what's the wind doing or what's happening to try to help them to to attune to certain information in the environment which may be influencing on that performance so just trying to get them to 
not necessarily external attention or focus, but just trying to get them to attune to other features within that environment, which, which I think for me, that, that may have a better transfer outside mm -hmm. of you or lesson or your activity. They may, it may end up the same, or not, not being as effective. They may not hit the target when if you'd have actually told them where to put their arm and how to do it, they may have done. But what we want to do is after they've left us is to continue. So I, I just I think sometimes it's about how we actually ask the questions and, and, and can we actually highlight to features in the environment rather than. Yeah. And, and but saying, of course, you could help them find the solution and then move on to a more complex. Why not? Like task mm -hmm. or activity. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point I was trying to make. It's the trajectory, right? The, when you help a little bit in the ecological approach, so you're not committed to staying there, <laughs> right? You, you're fully willing to let them go somewhere completely different. But you're just trying to get, here's, give you a little proficiency <laughs> so you don't lose motivation and, and things. And I, I think that that's a really good point. Um, what are, so maybe I'll, I'll go back to you, James, you know, the, um, you know, what are some, so we, uh, we've talked a lot about using the ecological approach and ecological dynamics. What are some of the use, the unique things about doing it with younger athletes versus adults? Do you think there's anything different about you know, the way you do it or, or is it just kind of use the same kind of approach? Or? I think you, you have to be more realize that their effectivities which are going on at that time are actual capabilities and their scaling is very different to what yours are so they, way they're interacting with the world and how they're seeing it mm -hmm. and, and and the potential all, all of it is, is very is very different so we we should so we we shouldn't um try to yeah again de show demonstrate and do things uh led uh, i guess it's being appreciative of yeah they are seeing and viewing the world in a very different w way because of all, where where their current development is uh, and that will um change just Sorry, Rob. So the question I've just kind of like ran myself around in circles a little bit there. Yeah, no, no. I think I, yeah, I was just kind of. I don't know if there. I you know some of the thoughts I had about how it, it differs is you know maybe using variability, right? When you're a younger athlete, they're going to be kind of inherently more variable, and probably the athletes the same age are probably going to massively different on how much they did with their parents in the backyard. So you really, I you probably have to be more sensitive in your design, right, to, um, Rich, or Rich, do you kind of, yeah? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, it, I, I'll just use an example for, from a group I'm working with right now, a, a youth um, a youth group where I have uh, 10, 11, 12 year olds, and we're talking very, very, like prepubescent 10 year old, who's very, very small, very, very physically. I mean, they're still athletic young individuals, they have coordination, they have abilities, but from a size standpoint, they haven't hit their maturation uh, level yet, or they haven't hit their, their their puberty level yet. And then I have kids who look like they're 14, 15 years old, and really they're 12. And so when you get a chance to to have to try to apply these uh, these methods and, and use the you know use these theories in groups where you have such a wide variety of, of young individuals on on a, on a big spectrum, it, it really uh, challenges you to to um, understand like how how am I going to scale this to meet these groups where they're at when they're all, or these kids where they're at when they're all in the same group. Um, and so I, I think it is, you know, drastically different than, than working with, you know, say a group of 16, 17, 18 year olds where yes, they're going to be at some different levels, but they're going to be a lot more similar than the, than the 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds that are in totally different places of maturation. And so it's, it's really challenged me uh, as a coach, uh, especially with working with the youth to, to really understand this idea of scaling and to really like Mark was saying, to understand like self-organization isn't, isn't always a good thing. You're going to have to understand when to step in, when to be more explicit, how to manipulate constraints in order to meet them where they're at. And so it just really keeps you on your toes. Yeah. yeah that's good. To add to, add to that, um, sure, go I'd say yeah. obviously with, with older athletes or say college or professional athletes, I, I, you know, when we're working on movements, you know, the, the goal is to give them exposure and experience to highly representative environments. So the, the context and the tasks that I'm building out for those athletes that are higher level are going to be very specific towards the problems that they're going to face in their sport. With youth athletes, that is definitely not uh, 
you know, an issue that I'm trying to tackle at all. I'm trying to give them as much abundance, as much diversity, as much variability in terms of the problems and, and the environments that they're going to face as possible. You know, it's just as, you know, how, you know, how are our youth or, you, you know, kids, toys, games, TV, entertainment, how are those designed? They're definitely catered and, and towards that youth population. So should our training, our practice environment should be geared towards those youth athletes. So the, the whole general global theme is different than say working with a higher level athlete and, and with youth. If, if they're the first goal is not fun and enjoyment and love of movement of whatever the sport is, then we're doing our athletes a, a, one, a tremendous disservice. That should be the number one priority for all practitioners of youth athletes should be fun and engagement. And we want them to come back the next time. If that's not the main goal, then again, like I said, we're doing a disservice. That is not necessarily the main goal of working with a, an athlete that does this for their job, a professional athlete. We're, we're trying to give them exposure and experience to very highly representative uh, tasks and contexts with youth athletes, more about, I think, variable contexts and environments um, so they can interact with so much, so many different rich environments. So you get this kind of abundance that we're kind of after. Yeah, oh, I'll just, cool. sorry, yeah, ahead, just, yes. I'll, oh. I'll pick up quickly because um, now I think the idea of young children, there's a lot of variability going on and it, there's, they're very much in, I guess what's important from this approach is to take your, a lot, a lot of time has to be spent on the planning beforehand. So how do you create environments which may afford or certain movements to emerge? So if you put a lot of um, inside a, a hall, a lot of um, mats down and wedges and um, these types of things, you may see more rolling type activities or emerging fr from that environment as long as it's functional we kind of can can let it go but i guess we're not trying to specify actions too much we're trying to more work on that kind of generality let them come up find their own signatures in moving and finding different ways to move through and navigate these environments yeah i think as we we got a question related to that kind of what you're talking about there james about i get this a lot of times from tom in the comments how do we structure a plan over a period of time so I think a key point everyone would make here, right? You, obviously, it's going to be very individual <laughs> and has to be flexible. But how do you think about, you know, I guess we're getting into kind of periodization, progression issues. What What do you, any thoughts on that? Rich, do you? you yeah, well, I think, I think as Michael kind of just touched on, um, or briefly is, is as they, as they grow older and as they, uh, as they mature and potentially start to choose one or two sports, that's when the activities that we begin to design, that's when they can start to, you know, to, um, to emulate the sports that in which they're trying to prepare for, you know? So as a, as a youth, obviously this idea of abundance and this idea of experiencing as many different, um, you know, movement landscapes as possible is obviously very important because the wider we can make their bandwidth, the younger that they are, you know, hopefully that the higher their athletic potential is later on in life. But when it comes time, you know, over here in the, in the, in the States, it's usually around the age of 16, 17, 18, you know, the, the ones who are going to go play at, at the college level, they start to choose, okay, you know, it's time for me to start to focus on football now. And so after that decision is made and after, you know, after they, um, they decide that's what they want to do, then these activities start to start to become a little bit more like the sport. And where it's not so much, you know, donor sport related, it's more about how can I, you know, how can I make most of the activities that I do look, feel, act and behave, you know, like the sport of football. And so I think that will be a, a major difference for me. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of a lot of changing and shifting. Um, and it's kind of going to be one of those pretty fluid, nonlinear processes. But but that would be one way that I would attack it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think that's, a, I think, and related to another, I think, a big difference with the, getting the challenge right and keep pumping it up at the young level is really critical. So some of these things like scaling, you got to be ready to scale back up when they start showing the, uh, really, really mastering it. So um, the people who are doing this really well is actually the Ajax Academy over in uh, mm -hmm. Amsterdam. They, they have this motto of like, obviously football, but first the athlete before the sportsman so that idea of just giving them lots of different exposure lots of different ways of moving playing with donor sports so sports which may have certain um, certain aspects in built into them which which will support them in their footballing career but yeah there's i guess that idea of generality before specificity or practice so mm -hmm. trying to get them to be good movers and we have to negotiate and adapt to environments 
um, prior to then trying to really specialize into movements. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Maybe we could pick that up a bit, Mark, maybe. Um, the kind of the difference, this the old school view of general motor skills, like eye-hand coordination and things that almost fit into the fundamental versus donor sport idea. Mark, do you have kind of distinction between those, what we're trying the to achieve? Between the, the, kind of the old school idea of generalized motor skills, like fundamental things like eye-hand coordination, uh, reaction time, uh, you know, versus donors, do donor sports. Do you have, when people, what, what is there a different? I think there's a difference here. We're trying to, yeah, well, yeah. I know my, um, friend of mine in Sheffield, mm -hmm. Ben is doing his PhD. Ben Stratford. Yeah. Ben very much mm -hmm. Donor sports. So he's Ben Stratford. Yeah. So he's, yeah, he's, he's particularly using, uh, uh looking into a lot of work around parkour. Mm -hmm. uh, as well, which which is very interesting, but I, I kind of don't really understand what you mean by general. You said reaction time. W what's that? So there used to be, I think, uh, is it Henry, the old idea that there's these set of generalized motor skills that you could measure. Yeah, but reaction time to what? It's like it's like the uh, taxonomies of yeah, I, uh, yeah. Like abilities. You like you have underlying yeah. abilities, which like Fleischmann's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a in, in different sports. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess the what the, the argument used to be that you had this general ability of reacting yeah. quickly to a stimulus that would make you good at every sport, <laughs> right? Well, there's well, this that, general that, skill. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I, uh, I mean, just because you're saying Bolt reacts quickly to a gun at mm -hmm. the start of a hundred meters race doesn't mean he's first to the ball. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I think the key, like for me, is when you're rich and you guys are talking about donor sports, is there's an overlap in the task, the di specific task dynamics information. It's not this general ability yeah. of catching <laughs> that you're going to yeah, be able to cool. use in cricket, baseball, you know. Um, so I, because I think some people get miss, they like, kind of misinterpret that donor yeah, sport. Yeah, that's idea. why I yeah. want to flesh yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to get, yeah. <laughs> because I, yeah. Know, I know this is out there. I've seen yeah. so many misinterpretations, so I was just too yeah. questioning there. Yeah. Can you guys, Michael, can you get a bit in it? What kind of donor, the donor sport idea you do in your program? Do you kind of ge like general uh, abilities that you develop first, that idea? Uh, yeah. So obviously with, with Ben there, you know, he looked at parkour. Um, so mm -hmm. we'll do various parkour courses with, you know, soft plyo boxes that they can jump over. Mm -hmm. Uh, that again, we don't really give them a whole lot of instructions that, hey, clear this box, jump this box with one hand, and they kind of solve those problems with themselves. I think obstacle courses, there's a little bit of literature out there showing that obstacle courses, various obstacle courses that, you know, involve a number of different um, problems for the young athletes to solve can be very beneficial. Uh, we do, we, I steal from gymnastics all the time, different tumbling, rolling, um, you know, cartwheel, somersault, somersault, you know, and then the other thing that we try to do is com combine some of those moves. So you have these transitioning skills where you're transitioning from, say, a, a parkour box jump into some sort of gymnastics movement into some sort of other skill. So I think the transitioning between various, uh, you know, modes of locomotion or various problem solving is very good for young athletes. So those are just some general ways that uh, we work on, to, you know, um, working on just overall movement abundance and some stealing from some of those donor sports. Yeah, I think that's a good good point too. Like the the donor sport, the similarity is at the problem level, similar prop movement problems, not at the physical movement level. The movement looks similar, so it's going to transfer, right? Yeah. Uh, you very donor sports may involve completely different kind of mo actual movements, um, but they may both involve using space, for example. One may involve jumping, one may involve running. But it, they might support each other, I think. Is, is yeah, you're trying to support yeah. just creativity. You're trying to support mm -hmm. some authentic, mm -hmm. organic movement. And I think those things transfer between, uh, you know, domains of sport. You know, oftentimes, you know, I think as coaches, we get, you know, caught up on, does it look the exact same? Is the movement mechanics, is the biomechanics the exact same? Because if they're not, they won't transfer. But we forget about, you know, things like creativity, things like being authentic about, you know, being uh, you know organic and how you pro solve problems, I think those things do transfer uh, between skills, even if they're not quite the same um, problems being asked to be solved or the same kind of um, movement biomechanics that look the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. Um, kind of the last thing I want to go back, maybe back to, is the measurement issue. Um, Mark, I wanted to, because this, I think, 
all this links in with something I know you're really passionate about selection, the, you know, selecting uh, the elite six-year-old elite athletes. <laughs> um, um, so this measurement problem, you know, I, I guess there's a reality we have to deal with with measurement and James expressed it, you know, it's not a bad thing inherently, but we need to evaluate coaches are being evaluated all the time by what their athletes are looking at. People are being selected based on technique on these move, fundamental movements and, you know, what is, what are your thoughts on how can we change that? And, and uh, hey, well, actually it's my, my daughter, she's 12. She was at, um, she's applied for a, a high school nearby, which is a kind of a basketball profile. And she's, she was there today. Actually, they had some kind of tryouts just for basketball. She rang me and I said, how'd it go? Oh, I think it went well. And I said, okay, what did you do? She says, oh, they just asked us to do some technical stuff. I said, what? Well, pass a ball, bounce and throw and dribble. I said, do you play a game? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I was, I, I, I mean, yeah, again, even even here in school, they're, that's what they're measuring. Can she dribble? Can she pass? Can she shoot? But you know, there's probably loads of people who can do that, but I can't. I can do that, but I cannot play basketball at all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think <clears throat> what I, I've kind of been banging something recently about this with regard to you said early selection and measurements and whatever. It's like really we need much better questions around what we're doing. And when people say to me about early selection, when they say to me about ability grouping and things, I just say to them, look, what's your understanding of the learner and the learning process? Because that's where we need to start. What's mm -hmm. your understanding of human learning and de in development? And if we, we need to start there as opposed to saying, is should we do early selection or should we ability group? Be, because we, we must have some sort of understanding of how humans learn in development. And I think... While measure, not saying measurement is bad, it's almost in many places. I've been at some Premier League clubs where they're measuring speed, sprint speed of nine-year-olds, mm -hmm. and I, and it's past a camera, you know? <laughs> and I'm like wondering what's that got to do with football, you know? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, yeah. Oh, but it's basically something to measure that when the kid doesn't make it, <laughs> they yeah. have they yeah. have a load of measurements all the way up, you know? Yeah. And, they're not really measured. There's the ecological validity of those measurements. Mm -hmm. It's pretty weak. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, James, I know there's something you've thought a lot about too, you know, and same as in schools, we got to put some evaluation on you in PE, right? We can't just you yeah. know, let you have a good time. <laughs> it has to be something. I know what, what are your kind of general thoughts? Just, I'm leaning towards the. I think it's part of the society we live in. We're going to have it there. It's something, but it's like trying to go, well, can we move it, the dial slightly and what we're trying to understand? So, mm -hmm. uh, can we understand how well children are functionally navigating an environment uh, and how they're interacting with an environment? Does that help us understand? So, we've been trialing in primary schools with children putting out this really quite enticing, exciting environment for them to ex and say, right, you have 90 seconds to find as many different ways to play with a ball or to travel, to play and move around this obstacle course, like in many, however you want to do. And, and we'll look at some, so for instance here, some children will just stand there and look at you for more instructions to tell you what to do next. And to me, that child has, that, that's worrying because they just don't know how to play or navigate or interact with these environments. And, and, and actually they're looking for me to tell them what to do next. Mm -hmm. So it, it, what, what I'm hoping for and what we see is like a, a child who has sh showing physical literacy would be go oh, right, take them to the park, off you go, and they just start whizzing around, creating games, socializing, playing with other kids, picking up just what occupying themselves and having fun during it and seeing affordances and i guess this goes to a point i kind of lost myself earlier they will see in affordances in an environment that we cannot see or bear and we should respect that and let them explore that so where i might see a um a, a tree which yeah whatever they may see a climbing they want to climb all over and jump around it and obviously there are points where we have to step in because it may be unsafe 
But if it's if we can create environments of safe uncertainty, where it's safe for exploration, but actually, yeah, if it's uncertain, they will have to explore and adapt to it, and that's really important. And that's what I guess what I'm trying to look at now is how do children navigate those environments, and, and does that tell us? So again, I think in performance sport, it's almost like a transfer test. Put them in mm. one environment, and then let's throw them into a different environment. And how do they adapt? Do they find a way uh, mm -hmm. and way find their way through, through it? And I think that, to me, would be a much healthier way, more exciting way from them because they've got some intentionality about what they're doing. Yeah, I, I think. And, and but we have to think about those environments we're creating. So you you, don't, you need to and think how and maybe think well, what kind of is it for instance the children if i'm not worried about what sport it's just how many different ways are they doing it but do i want more of a convergent space of going you know what we'd really like to see these types of movements of what emerge because we're coaches we're highly skilled we have knowledge of that environment and we're attuned to that environment and we should see certain things so i think there's just it needs to be a bit of a paradigm shift in how we're we're understanding why yeah why we're testing as mark said but then the environments we're creating to, to uh, can, can, yeah, more of a transfer test, less of this kind of mastery or specific. It, let's look for adaptation and how they adapt to them. Yeah, I think Keith, Keith's one of Keith's favorite things, not, not learning to move, learning to learn to move. Right? Yes. Learning to solve problems and be adaptable and mm. functional, I think. Yeah, yeah that's not really related to automaticity, basically. We're not trying yeah, that. Yeah, that was, yeah. What it says. yeah. Yeah, I've had, related to that, I've had a... At least four or five, three or four people tell me recently that when they've adopted, switched to kind of using this approach in, in the ecological, more ecological approach, they think the gym sounds different. Just the sound of the people playing or practicing or in the playground. It just, you can tell something's different by the sound <laughs> without even looking at doing, which I think is kind of reflecting what you were describing, James. But that's sometimes a challenge because a lot yeah. of teachers will, well, oh, it's making far too much noise. Too much noise. <laughs> not, not the educators, but the, the head teacher or senior management walking along are like, oh, you need to, you're disturbing the lessons in the classroom. So you, yeah, you do. But I don't know, that's just part of that goodness of fit. Like you, you hear a basketball squeaking on a court. For me, I'm like, oh, that's, that's cool. That's like, like it bring uh -huh. it red. Light. Yeah. So it's all part of it. Like, um, but sorry, that's enough from Yeah, me. no, no, I agree. I agree. I see that all the time in the park I go to. I used to see all the time the the fun game loud and, and then real practice would start. <laughs> it was a dour and quiet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, enough of a play. And that's, yeah, yeah. That's, I think we've just got it the wrong way around. But yeah. I have a question back to the kind of donor sports. I have a question from Callum here. Um, what do you guys think about um, so a sport that's not really sharing the affordances, but using um, this is something I, I've talked about. I think this is useful for, I would call it body awareness, um, developing your, your, I think you're tuning into a different senses. Maybe it's not specific in the same way that you're going to use it in another sport. But I think it just gives you more capacity. Um, it's going to open up more affordances when you go back to your your other sport. Do you guys do you kind of promote that? So yeah, just I guess it picked up on my point when I was yeah. talking about generality. It wasn't on the idea of like mm -hmm. Fleischmann's abilities and those things, but it's more around this overall adaptability environment. And and I guess Karen Adolf's work around as. Uh, as as through functional movement skill performances, new capacities will emerge and new opportunities will emerge. So through doing something like ballet or gymnastics and having superior balance, well, does that then transfer to when you're volleying on a football pitch on one leg or something like that? And you see that with um, who's the you're know this um, the guy plays used to play for Real Madrid with a ponytail mark or. Um, he did he did a uh, judo or taekwondo. Oh, you're too. thinking of Zlatan. Zlatan, yeah, a bomb. Yeah, like you, when he's or kicking a ball, you see his taekwondo and judo kicks in a way. Yeah, yeah. Right. it's that kind of functionally adapting to the environment and yeah, using the effectivities you have available to you. So I I think it's a yeah. Yeah, James, uh, go on YouTube and look at his goal against Italy in 2004, and you'll see exactly that. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I would say that for me, this is in the same way that properly designed strength and conditioning helps helps you develop skill, right? It gives you greater capacity, opens up more affordances um, in the same way. I see, Rich, you could. Yeah, well, I, I just say, I, mean, I don't have anything overly sciencey, but I will say that after working with, again, predominantly kids in that eight to 12 range over the last few years, we have a number of them that participate in these parkour gymnastics type programs. They're not competing in them per se, but they're, you know, they're going to facilities where they're allowed to kind of explore and, the, the creativity, the confidence, the fluidity, the coordination that these kids possess, that you can tell that these kids are doing something different. Um, and I've just, I've seen it with my own eyes that the confidence is the word that comes to mind. They just, they have so much more abundance and they're so much more confident in their body and space. Um, they're okay with failure, obviously with, with gymnastics and parkour, there's a tremendous amount of failure involved there. And so, um, when it comes time to actually participate in sport and, and, and do some more performance related activities, failure is not an issue for these kids. They, 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 um, they understand that failing is kind of part of the process. And so I just think I've seen, I've seen a confidence and an abundance in kids that participate in those, uh, gymnastics part, you know, parkour, um, you know, ballet type activities that I just don't see in kids who are not part participating in them. The other, the other thing that I see a lot of is, is, these kids then learn to develop kind of this risk management, you know, yep. how and when to take risks. And obviously that, you know, taking a risk in parkour can, you know, can lead to them, like Rich said, having confidence to take risk in to, you know, in, in a basketball, make a drive through to the hoop or whatever it may be. So I see a lot of benefit in them learning their bodies and how and when to take risks. So this risk management is another big skill that I see them learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that relates back to Mark's example from the start of why kids gravitate towards trees, right? The playgrounds, yeah, you know, you understand it, but they're becoming more and more constrained and safe and less big gaps to jump from. And, you know, I think that yeah, you understand the motivation, but it also, you're, I think that's really important. Michael, it's a good point. Um, looks like we're almost out of time, guys. Um, last, I just wanted to Rich, I want to get can if people are interested in origins, where um where can they find information? Yeah, so just uh just go into our website, emergentmovement.com, emergentmvmt.com is where obviously origins is located along with the rest of our courses. And then you know you can um you can look us up on, on our social media platforms as well. We have uh we have a link tree in our bios and stuff like that that will lead you to our courses, but that's that's where you can find it. Okay, great. Thanks, guys, and thanks, everyone. Thanks for the questions. And